working remotely so dramatically reduces the friction in all kinds of aspects. We get more done faster, no question, with the right tools, that's the key thing. So I'm Amy Jo Kim, the CEO of Game Thinking, and I've been running an online-only business for over a decade. And today, what I wanna do is share with you some of the biggest mistakes we made and also the lessons we learned from that that allow us now to have a very successful, high-impact online-only business. So I'm here today with my co-founder and partner, Scott Kim who runs this business as well. Now, Scott is an expert game designer and puzzle designer who specializes in educational games. I've been designing educational games for many years. Most recently, I led the mastery games effort at abcmouse.com, a site that delivers education to millions of kids all over the world. Now, I want to tell you a story that helped me understand how best to think about online education. This is Saul Khan, founder of the Khan Academy. Now, when he started off, he didn't know anything about education. He was just making short videos to help his young cousin do her homework. When he offered to tutor her in person, she turned down the offer saying, I like you better on video. Well, after the initial shock, he realized that she had a point. A video lets the learner watch on their own time and replay parts they don't understand as many times as they want. Furthermore, any video he made could live forever, multiplying his reach by millions. And so he quit his day job and started the Khan Academy, a free online resource of educational videos and activities that students all over the world are now using to supplement or even replace parts of their education. Saul had discovered a basic truth about online education. It's different from in-person education and in some ways better. And to do it well, you have to rethink how you deliver the information so it best fits the online medium. And all of us together are needing to learn how online is different than the physical world right now. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing that story. Yes, absolutely. So, so I want to tell you how we moved our business online. I know a lot of you are really interested in how to do better work from home. And there's a ton of resources. I've been sharing a lot, I know you have too, about a lot of the mechanics of working from home. And you know, take breaks, make sure to drink water and stretch, um, brush your hair, those sorts of things. But I wanna tell you about some of the really structural changes we made based on mistakes that allowed us to have a thriving and growing online only business that is largely uninterrupted by the kinds of problems that we're all seeing now. So we've been, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for over a decade, but as a game designer for hire, I've been working largely online and remotely with many clients for at least two decades. I worked with Square Enix, who's in Japan. I did several in-depth projects with um, Harmonix, who's in Boston. I did a whole project with Unity and a team based in Finland. Now I would occasionally have meetings. Sometimes we would have a meeting when we were both at a conference. Occasionally we would fly somewhere to meet with a client. We do that less and less, but over the years we have done that. And then three, six, nine months after that, it's all completely online work out of necessity. And what we found was that if we just tried to get people in a room to do a workshop for a day, which is a common way we would kick off projects, when we would meet physically, that didn't work at all. It doesn't make any sense to get together for eight hours online. It just doesn't. Uh, boy, have I fallen flat with trying that one. So that was one big mistake we made. And another mistake we made was worrying too much about the tools. Now, some tools are better than others, it, no question. And the tools have improved dramatically. I'm talking video conferencing. Uh, doc collaboration with Google Docs, Google Slides, Sheets, etc., and Slack for real-time, uh, you know, real-time messaging with history and channels. Those are amazing tools. But 20 years ago, we had IRC, and we had, um, you know, email, and we had all kinds of ways to message together. And 
Skype's been around for a long time too. I was a very early user of that. I complain about it all the time, but I used it. You use the tools that are available. So one thing I learned is focusing on finding just the right tool is a fool's errand. You use the tools available, you get your work done and you work out protocols and rhythms that get the work done. That's far more important than any individual tool. After many, many years of this very deep project collaboration where I would be a game designer for hire, playing a crucial role on a team for six months, nine months, a year, sometimes longer, I experienced a surge in interest for my techniques and people wanting the results they had seen me get with these other projects that had turned into hits. And I realized that if I could distill my methodology into a step-by-step -step system that was usable, at least by a narrow group of people, startup CEOs in general and game designers, then I could reach a lot more people and teach them to get the kind of results I was getting with private clients by empowering them rather than by doing it for them. So I started down that journey seven years ago. I started to really codify and put into a step-by-step -step system the methodology we were using and frankly the best of the methodology because over the last 20 years made a lot of mistakes tried a lot of things some of them worked better than others i bet you found that too so we put really the best of what we saw working again and again and again in different situations into this step-by-step -step methodology in order to reach more people and to work more effectively remotely Fast forward to today, that was seven years ago. We've been running an online masterclass for the last six years that reach, has reached, at this point, thousands of people all over the world. We run um, an accelerator that delivers what used to take us six to nine months working very closely with private clients in three months because the uh, process has become codified and because working remotely so dramatically reduces the friction in all kinds of aspects. We get more done faster, no question, with the right tools. That's the key thing. So I wanted to share five tips. It's not everything, but it's things we learned, tips we've adopted. Some of them might seem obvious, some might seem counterintuitive, but I share these hoping that you can benefit and that you can try out some of these and have a more productive, and fulfilling and high impact remote working relationships and better collaboration with your colleagues online. Are you working remotely for the first time in a long time? Have you been working remotely for a long time and you got a bunch to share? Let us know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you and really keep this conversation going. Tip number one, codify your process. Take what you know how to do, maybe take a slice of it because some of it's really hard, and codify it. I can't tell you how useful it's been for me to do that, knowing that it probably wasn't perfect, wasn't right, and then have this constant stream of clients and students to give me feedback and help me make it better. Everything you know about lean startup and agile and smart iterative prototyping and testing applies to your system. So codify it, don't be afraid of making an early draft. It won't be perfect. And then run people through it and make sure you get feedback and figure out how it could be better. Tip two, embrace micro learning with short, punchy, high learning videos. So micro learning is a phrase that I first heard from my colleague and friend, Carl Cap. Many of you may know Carl Cap. He's a regular mentor in our programs. So if you're my client or student, you definitely do. And Carl is a leading gamification and games-based learning proponent. He teaches at Bloomsburg College. And he recently wrote a book called Microlearning. And that's a fancy word for short, high-impact, actionable learning. That's what works online. This may seem like motherhood and apple pie to some of you, of course, but many people who are coming online for the first time, especially from the university, the first thing you do is you say, well, I'll give my lecture online. I always had about a half hour lecture for class. Sounds good. <sighs> Don't do that. That doesn't work. Um, what works online, and Saul Khan taught us so much about this. Scott's story about Saul Khan. Really look at that and figure out how it works. What works online is to break up the learning into short five to 10 minute videos. They could even be two to three minutes, but not our lectures. 
if you've got something to say, organize it well enough that you can make it modular into really small pieces. Even better. Each piece has, should have an action after it. What action do you want your students or your learners to take or your colleagues to take? Here's this little thing. How can they put that to use right away? That's micro learning. So sh if you shift your thinking from long meetings and long lectures and long things to short chunks of well-organized work and learning, that can go a long way toward making your online work even better than in the real world. I'd love to hear your stories about your own lessons about microlearning. I bet some of you have some great stories. The third tip is to tune your templates for sharing. Now, this is something it took me many years to learn, and I'd love to help you leapfrog ahead and not have to go through all that iteration and learning. I'm a template kind of person. I like to put together templates to organize work and just flow it and put guardrails on it and make things better and faster. So I always had templates. But we, you know, we would set, they were Microsoft Word docs, you know, um, uh, game design documents at that time, uh, that sort of thing. And we would do prototyping too, but they weren't really designed for sharing. Even when Skype was around, we would be sending them back and forth, et cetera. And then when we started doing our courses about seven years ago, I also had templates. We tried all these different organizations. We made so many mistakes with our templates. First, I copied what I saw everyone around me doing and I made them PDFs. Oh, here's some PDFs for you to download and print out. And then I realized, well, that's not, it doesn't really work for my audience. Why would you wanna do that? That's not very good for sharing. That's not optimized for sharing unless you're in the same place. Guess what? More and more teams are distributed. Most of the teams I work with are distributed. Whether or not there's a core group in an office, someone's out sick, someone's traveling. So distributed work is like the norm. Like we have 12 steps to our process, but that's too many templates. And one flows into the other. So then we put them all together into one long document since they flow into each other. That was overwhelming. Finally, after grouping and regrouping and remixing and testing and tuning, finally, we realized there's really five key steps. Each step has several of what used to be separate templates in them. And we can put them into Google Docs with fill in the blank areas. And that's what we did. And that's what's in all our programs now. And they are optimized for sharing in horizontal mode. So you're probably, you might be watching this on a phone and looking at it vertically, but most of the people that do the work with our templates are doing it on a laptop or on a desktop. And that screen is horizontal. So the simple step of optimizing your templates for being displayed and screen shared inside of a Google Hangouts or Zoom or Skype horizontally, if you do that, you will save lots of time, lots of scrolling, et cetera, et cetera. It was mind blowing the effect that that made. So think about in your world, how you can optimize your templates, Put, you know, assuming you have templates that are your codified system. How, you, how can you optimize your templates for sharing and for remote work? And that's how we did it, you know, horizontally oriented, Google Docs, where a chunk of work is organized into a template, the templates flow into each other, but there's a lot you do within each one. Each one is very substantial. So I know that uh, one of the questions I get a lot, I got it this morning on a call with one of my coaches, is how we share our materials with clients. The short answer is we use whatever systems they're comfortable with, but our preferred way of doing it is Google Docs. And the reason is it's so, so easy to share. Everybody can get access. So we share, we have templates built in Google Docs. We have many slideshows that we share with our clients and with our coaches that are in Google Slides. Again, because it's so easy, you don't have to ask, are you PowerPoint or are you a uh, keynote? And we also share a lot of spreadsheets in Google Sheets. Now it's not the only way to do it. If we have a client who's behind Firewall, if they're just determined to use WebEx against all better judgment, you know, if they're no offense, WebEx, but it's not the best tool. And if uh, they really want to use their internal collaboration system, some of our clients have very strict regulatory issues where they literally can't use Google Docs. They're in the gambling industry or in, you know, the medical industry where there's very sensitive records. So we use what our clients do, but if they're open to whatever, we use the simplest possible thing that's wide, most widely available. 
So that's how we've done it. And it's really sped up our work. It's part of why we're able to get the results that used to take six months and three months. Tip number four, always provide replays of live meetings. This again, might seem obvious, but sometimes you forget to hit your replay button or your settings on on replay or you misplace the replay or it gets mangled, right? With, you know, when it gets saved to the hard drive, maybe there wasn't enough space, all true stories, lots of mistakes with replays. But what I've learned is that if you're going to work effectively online, especially if you're working with a team and you're in a leadership position, which is what I am when I'm working with teams, if you set up your meetings, always record them. Uh, we even have some of our recorded meetings edited by our internal editor to be tighter for replays and then regularly post the replay the next day or a few hours later if you have it. Organize the replay, make it one place, make it really easy to get at. It could be in a Dropbox folder, it could be in a teachable you know, course, which we use as a CMS. It could be in a Google Drive, it could be in a you know, linked list somewhere else. There's a lot of ways to organize your replays. If you get into the habit and everyone on your team knows well, gosh, I can't make the meeting, but I, I have this comforting, strong sense that I can catch up on the replay and there'll be some summary notes and to-dos that the leader will share. So that's the other thing is, you know, just like any meeting, what are the tips? Somebody needs to be empowered to say, okay, here's the summary, here's the to-dos, go. We do that in our meetings on Slack with the team right after the meeting. You can do it in email, you can do it in Discord, wherever. But that along with then a link to the replay really makes your team members feel taken care of and it lowers their stress if it's unavoidable to miss a meeting. And sometimes, especially when you have like well-organized meetings and great templates, those meetings are really high quality, high impact. People wanna go to the replay that were there because they're like, oh my God, the way we put that, that was such perfect copy. I wanna grab that and like work it into my marketing. Boom, you got the replay, there it is. Sometimes we even get transcripts of the replays for certain clients, depending on the replay. So don't discount the power of packaging up your replays in a way that helps your team or your students and that they can count on. Think about putting that into your process. All right, and then the fifth and final tip that I wanna share with you is find a way to empower small groups to collaborate together. So size matters. There's no way around it. Size matters when it comes to online communications. You know that a text chat among four or five friends is very different than among 30 people organizing a party, very different experience. What do people do? They form breakout groups of smaller groups. So what I've learned is if you have a very large group of people, 30, 40, 50, 100, 400, in any kind of real-time meeting, that's completely unmanageable for interactivity. What works for interactivity is four to eight people, maybe up to 10. So how do you manage that if you've got a bigger group, breakout groups? Rather than being a lecturer as a teacher, you can record your lectures in small micro learning chunks, and then you can be a coach and facilitator for small groups of students, put them in breakout rooms. Zoom has breakout rooms, I use those. Put them in breakout rooms and go around to the breakout rooms, just like you would if people were in groups in a classroom. Small groups are really great, especially when you're distributed. They're, you can get so much done. Part of the magic of how we get so much done is we work with teams of four to 10 people. Sometimes it stretches to 12, but that's really the core group and it's magic. So think about how you can either work with multiple parallel small groups or take a much larger group and integrate a small group breakout strategy into that larger group in order and do it regularly as part of your online connection and communication and training. Those are my five tips. I hope that you found this useful. I'd love to know which of these tips connected to you. Which of these do you either already do or you're interested to try? I would love to know, leave me a comment. Let's keep that conversation going. And if you have a question about any of these, how we do it, um, when we do it, et cetera, go ahead and ask those questions as well. If you find this really interesting and you're like, yeah, I'm all about working from home, I'm all about high impact remote collaboration, all our programs run that way. And we have a couple of programs coming up. Uh, one is for coaches 
trainers and consultants who want to learn and leverage Game Thinking Toolkit as a certified coach. That is coming up in April, kicks off in April. And we also have a five-day boot camp, which is a high-impact online workshop done right. And that's coming up in May. That's for product leaders, startup CEOs, innovation experts, anyone who really wants a crash course in how to bring your idea to life faster and smarter. If you want to be on the inside loop, and if you want to hear about offers first, if you want to get special access to discounts and exclusive trainings that are not available to the public, join the Game Thinking Hub. That's our group on LinkedIn. And we're going to be very active there over the next few weeks. So if you go to gamethinking.io slash hub, it'll take you right to the group. If you're already a member, you'll come in. If you're not, go ahead and apply to join. And over the next few weeks, I'll be talking more about these programs and sharing more exclusive trainings, both on game thinking and about how to apply game thinking in this new world that we all find ourselves living in.